Bless our voices, that they may be used for kindness, our ears for compassion, our hands for charity, our minds for truth, and our hearts for love. Amen. What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? This is a question that sages and prophets and Everyday common folk have been asking themselves throughout the ages. Today we heard responses to this question from the prophet Micah, from a gifted psalm writer, from Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Micah is one who's referred to as a minor prophet, not because he's considered less important than, say, Isaiah, Minor prophets are ones whose writings are not as lengthy as the others. Although Micah used fewer words, what he had to say on God's behalf was truly major words of wisdom. In response to the question, what does the Lord require of you? Meaning us. Micah's response was simple. Do justice love kindness, and walk humbly with God. So we may ask, how are we to do humble and kind works of justice? The composer of Psalm 15 provided us with some specific details. The first bit of advice, speak the truth. A later verse said it this way, don't take back your word. We also heard this, don't do evil or heap contempt on your friends and neighbors. A few centuries later, Jesus would greatly expand our understanding of who our neighbors are. Spoiler alert, they're not just people that we like or people who we see as being just like us. Here's another example from the Psalm writer. Honor those who fear, that is, stand in awe of and revere the Lord. Lastly, the psalmist reminded those who wish to do what the Lord desires, not to give money merely in hope of gain, nor to take a bribe against the innocent. Greed and hunger for power and the desire to abuse and dominate others are not what God desires of God's people. In Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, he explained that what the worldly powers desire and value are much different than what the Lord requires. When Paul wrote that God will destroy the wisdom of the wise and that the discernment of the discerning will be thwarted, He was being sarcastic. What he was saying is that the worldly wise are not really that wise, nor are they truly discerning. They would be more accurately described as cunning, greedy, and manipulative. On the other hand, those whom the privileged and elite call foolish, that is, followers of Christ, are really the ones who have true wisdom. They seek to live according to God's will. In his own words, and by turning upside down the worldview of his time, Paul was sharing his own version of Jesus' Beatitudes. Yes, Jesus had set an example for Paul's thinking. Jesus taught that the poor in spirit are not to be looked down upon, punished, or reprimanded. Now, being poor in spirit can be interpreted in several ways. It may mean suffering from depression or being emotionally drained or dealing with learning disabilities. These are just a few examples. In God's kingdom, 
The poor in spirit are all cherished, and they are all to be blessed with loving care. Those who mourn are not to be avoided. Many people in my grief support group tell how they find that many people are uncomfortable around their sorrow. And former relationships have been cut off. And so in addition to their grief, they experience loneliness and rejection. So the blessing of gathering with a group who are willing to listen is how they are blessed and comforted. Jesus continued his list of blessings. Those who are meek are not to be taken advantage of by those with power and privilege. Those who hunger for righteousness are not to have their efforts thwarted by those who benefit by unrighteous customs, norms, and practices. Like the prophet Micah and the writer of Psalm 15, Jesus also praised those who seek justice, the ones who demonstrate kindness, and all who walk humbly with God. He taught that the peacemakers, the merciful, and the pure in heart are the ones who are blessed. Let's imagine how the Sermon on the Mount might take place in our own time. Possibly something like this. When Jesus saw the folks gathering in the church hall, he invited them to pull up chairs and have a seat. And when everyone was settled and comfortable, Jesus took a chair himself and began to teach. Blessed are they who place the love of family and friends before all else, who possess a spirit of gratitude that compels them to give of their own blessings to others, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who grieve and struggle to cope, but continue to hope. The single mom or dad trying to raise their children alone. The parents who wait for their lost daughter or son to return. For they will be comforted. Blessed are they who find their joy in the happiness of others. The young couple just starting out. The devoted teacher. The dedicated minister. For they will inherit the earth. Blessed are they who can see beyond their own interests and agendas to recognize the greater common good. Those who understand and honor their ethical and social responsibility to their community, for they will be filled. Blessed are they who treat classmates and co-workers and employees with respect and dignity. Those who never forget what it was like to struggle to raise a family or to be a new kid or to start a new job. Those who keep in mind the many times they have been forgiven and received a second and third chance that they didn't deserve, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are they who seek justice for the poor and the abused, who speak up for the victimized and the powerless, who refuse to compromise in matters of justice and truth, for they will see God in the faces of those whom they serve. Blessed are they who possess the rare gift of bringing people together, who possess the humility to make the first move to forgive, who enable reconciliation to take place, those who bring healing to ones who've been hurt and ignored or rejected, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who are ridiculed and criticized for doing what is just and good, 
who refuse to give in to the cynicism around them, who will not rationalize injustice and justify falsehoods, for the reign of God is theirs. Rejoice and be glad, Jesus told the group that had met that night in the church hall, for your reward in heaven will be great. Kwame Stewart is someone we could describe as a Beatitudes person. One day he spotted a homeless man sitting on the ground and on his lap was a dog with the telltale signs of fleas. Kwame, a veterinarian, returned with medications for the suffering dog. A week later, the rash below the scratched off fur was gone. And since then, Dr. Stewart has helped roughly 400 street pets. You see, to a homeless person, their pet is often their only friend. One such person, Joe, explained that his dog is his reason for getting up in the morning. My dog is the answer to my prayers, Joe says. Every morning when I wake up, her tail is wagging, and I don't feel that overwhelming loneliness. Every time, in every place, there are Beatitude people. In our own families, in our own towns, and in our own parish. These are people who have embraced the blessedness of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. They've recognized the many blessings they possess. They seek to reveal God's blessings in the lives of others through compassion and generosity, mercy and peace. They that trust in the mercy of God that they've experienced in their own lives, and they seek to be the means for others to realize God's presence in their lives. And so we pray. Holy and gracious God, we humbly pray that your empowering grace will illuminate and inspire our hearts, that we may embrace the vision of the Beatitudes. We seek your most holy grace and may we see it in all persons, in all circumstances, and in all of your creation. Amen. We seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly with our God.